Very good. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Overseas Development Institute to uh, hear some wise words and some discussion on the question of why a techno-centric approach fails the resilience challenge. And a lot of the discussion will be based on this extremely fine report and investigation here, which, of which there are plenty of copies outside if you haven't picked one up already. Um, just a, a few words of introduction uh, from myself before I introduce the speakers, both in terms of what it is we're discussing and uh, who's on the panel, though I guess you know quite a lot of them. Certainly it's interesting. Some friendly greetings, so I guess you know one of the two people around the, around the table here. Um, I guess the reason why this is, is being talked about is it, it's widely felt that the acute pain of climate change is likely to be felt first in the developing and less developed world. Also, I think there's a feeling here in, if you like, the more economically wealthy end of the world that the developing world are likely to be the victims of this and they're not the culprits of this. They're also perhaps vulnerable due to greater dependence, more vulnerable due to greater dependence on agriculture, often in zones of climatic extreme, lacking perhaps some of the technological protection that gives us some shield from climate change. And in fairly, uh, perhaps rather brutal terms, they have a, a perhaps a, a weaker grasp on, on the actual chances of survival. And so changes in that environment are more likely to hit them first. Um, there are also strains from existing poor governance and political tension, either within states or between states, so conflict that may or may not be promoted by climate change, but if it is, it may arrive there sooner than it does here. And also, of course, some of the big causes or potential causes of climate change lie in the developing world, be they greater urbanization, fossil fuel explosion that we've already had here, but maybe they're yet to have there, deforestation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a sort of double responsibility, I guess, that we feel that, uh, first of all, it's uh, our fault in the first place, and secondly, others may suffer earlier and to a greater extent. So that's why we're particularly interested in the impact that climate change may have. So the aid and development community are keen to help, and like all things when it comes to helping, you want to identify the problem, find a solution, and then apply that solution I guess the purpose of dis today's discussion is to explore whether uh, we and, and, and other, if you like, uh, uh, provision uh, countries that are perhaps hold more of the uh, purse strings of the aid, um, in combination with the host countries, could do this job better. Have some of the diagnoses of the problem been too narrow, a bit naive, and, and consequently ineffective? With a very few exceptions, we're not really questioning the motives of why people are doing this. They're normally done for noble causes, but in effect, sort of how could we improve the effectiveness of what's being done, what's being suggested and what's being actually done? Um, so that's just the context. Uh, myself, for those who don't know, I, my name is Tom Heap. I'm a journalist now, a freelance, working predominantly in broadcast journalism, both for BBC Radio and uh, television on issues of environment, food, and uh, development. I have to say, occasionally development. I'm not an expert on this subject, uh, but thankfully I am surrounded by them today. So uh, in the best uh, Radio 4 phrase, let's meet the team. Um, uh, firstly, um, uh, on uh, my right here, Katie Peters from the uh, ODI. She's a research fellow here, an author of this report on uh, climate change, knows a lot about climate change and resilience, has worked uh, f uh, and advise the government as well as working in the NGO sector. Um, Simon on the uh, left hand side here, Simon Levine also at the uh, Overseas Development uh, Institute, a co-author of this report, very much focused in the humanitarian policy group, has had many many years in the field during wars, after wars, has lived in, Mo uh, lived in Uganda and worked in Mozambique, Cambodia, Burundi, many many places. Uh, Tom Tanner for the Institute of Development Studies, has uh, worked for the UK and the Bangladeshi government, and he's written the first definitive work on the subject, Climate Change and Development. So uh, he quite literally wrote the book. Um, <laughs> Laurie Goering here, uh, a, a journalist with AlertNet, uh, a climate website uh, for uh, Thomson Reuters, who's 
readership are really some of the key decision makers in this area. Um, formerly a foreign correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, worked in, in many countries, uh, Delhi, Q8, uh, Johannesburg, and covered uh, wars in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Ivory Coast, and others. Uh, so that's the speaker. Now, a little bit about the structure of this debate, of this uh, day, rather. Uh, each speaker, w in turn, will have the floor either to make a presentation or in discussion with me. And then, sort of, for the that'll take about half the time. And then, for the second half, it'll very much be um, uh, for the audience to get involved, both in terms of asking questions. And as I know, you're an expert audience here. Also, if you've got points to make or things that you think need saying from your own experience, then do make those clear, do let us hear them, try and keep them uh, quite succinct, let's say uh, more in the realm of tweets and texts rather than lengthy multi-page emails when it comes to uh, what you have to say. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the main thrust of this is, is with climate change affecting our lives, what can we do about it? And the message that comes through again and again is include the people, include the society, include the power structure of the place that you're working in. To um, adapt a familiar phrase, it's the politics, stupid. Uh, we've got three fine examples in this report of where this has um, perhaps not been uh, sufficiently done overseas, has been ignored and underestimated, and I'll come to those in a moment, but just a quick thought from our own country. Uh, we, of course, have had extreme floods, or fairly extreme floods, some people might actually argue about that, but they've certainly been long duration floods in this country. And boy, oh boy, can you see the importance of, of politics here when it comes to that. Um, first of all, um, the cause. Is it climate change or not? That's clearly uh, and the importance of climate change. That's been debated and is certainly political. The more immediate cause or not, is it to do with dredging? Is it about hard defences or working with nature? That's clearly political. If you read the right-wing press, you'd, got the, you'd have got the opinion here that the Environment Agency and others had sort of been taken over by something between the Greens and the Reds who just wanted to welcome the water in of every available opportunity. There's been a great deal of political caricature. And there's also choices. Is it about saving farms or front rooms? That's clearly a political choice. Even the accusation that people at the top are playing politics. It seemed to me that Eric Pickles welcomed this because it was a chance for some great political mileage for him, his own political career. So everything is seen through these political spectacles, even, I would suggest, further at the top than that. The danger or the issue for Cameron, like some people said, was this a political issue? Someone even referred to it to me as David Cameron's New Orleans, or David Cameron's Katrina. Now, I think that slightly ignored the fact that thousands of people, over a thousand people died in that disaster, whereas, as far as I know, possibly one man who was hit by a car that electrocuted him, uh, sorry, wire that electrocuted him, no one has died here. But I think the point was the danger for him is it could show the leader being some way out of control. Once again, a political issue that comes up. So that's just so it is on our own doorstep. It's not about all about them. It, it, it's also about us. And just briefly, uh, the case studies that, that are mentioned here uh, and um, worth having a, having a closer look at. But I think they illustrate different things. Um, firstly, an issue of um, funds available for um, averting deforestation in Aceh in Indonesia. And this is really a question. This comes down to kind of who rules. So the story here was that there was uh, Indonesia is potentially a huge player in the climate change story, massive forests and massive potential deforestation by some measures, the largest emitter of CO2. And the, there was a lot of money available potentially through, through what's called RED, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Up to 4.5 million available. Um, so there was a big pot of money potentially around for people to, to, to work with and to help do some good with. But because they'd had a civil war which had only just ended, loss of around 20,000 lives involving that in, 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 as a result of that, there was a new administration in one of the, in, uh, the Aceh region and there was a split in who's responsible. In the end, it comes down to you know, the, uh, the people on the ground are looking at this pot of gold and arguing over who will decide over how it's been to be spent and this confuses donors, so the money in the end doesn't come. So that was a question. Because they didn't decide, couldn't be sensitive enough on who rules, it didn't work. 
The second, it would seem, I would say, is an example of almost a Trojan horse, that is to say climate change being used to further an ambition that had nothing to do with climate change, possibly in the first place. This is Ethiopia and Uganda, respectively <coughs> Uganda's National Adaptation Programme and Ethiopia's Green Energy Strategy. This was ostensibly about how dryland people can adapt to the dangers of, of climate change and help to uh, lessen the problem. But the solution seemed to be all about moving away from cattle towards crops, forestry and chickens. It was, in effect, an attack on uh, their way of life, their pastoralist way of life, which was described in some government circles as a social evil to be eradicated. They wanted them all to settle down and be nice farmers, um, really, so they could offer something at the international table. And it would seem to me that the result of that was it was both just unjust and ineffective. Uh, the third example, perhaps... Uh, most controversial in uh, climate change circles is the conflict in Darfur. First of all, we've got the issue of whether Darfur is actually a, a conflict caused by climate change, uh, which there is some dis discussion on in this paper, and I know is, is, uh, is widely debated and how much it's um, to do with climate change. I think in the end it comes down to um, it's a fight over control of, of resources and the argument goes that if climate change is lessening the quantity of those resources, does that make the conflict worse? And by way of solution, it, the, apparently the humanitarian action play, uh, plan for Sudan basically simply focuses on um, giving, in effect, more stuff, making available more food, more water, more agricultural technology. And so the question arises, if you're, fight, if you're already fighting over limited stuff, does making more stuff available stop you fighting? Is it in the end about quantity or inequality? So those are come, so kind of some of the uh, areas that I think we'll be, be talking about here. If you want more details on those, have a quick uh, flick through your, your document as we are talking. Um, just to let you know, when it comes to the discussion, and generally we have got, uh, as well as the people in the audience, uh, physically, we have another 120 or so online joining us. And if I could courage, encourage both the speakers here, and when it comes to your turn, uh, you as speakers, to talk into the mics, although we can probably hear you across the room, those online will not be able to hear you unless you speak into the microphone. So, if I can come first to Katie. Uh, Katie, you've got your, your own presentation to give, mm. so if we can... Uh, get on with that, that'd be great. Yeah, Thank you very great. much. 